This episode features the work of a brewer or distiller and is intended for viewers of legal drinking age. Please enjoy craft beverages responsibly. Thank you. All of those brewing books, of course, meant that you had to brew so that you could test out recipes and things. So Absolutely. I began to brew as often as probably 30 or 40 times a year, Wow! which is ridiculous in hindsight. <laughs> right. It's a lot of beer. Welcome back everyone to Vermont Craft Tours. I'm Sarah Scully and I'm here today in the Lebanon Homebrew Shop um, with my friend Scott Russell. Hi Scott. Good morning Sarah. Welcome Thank uh, and thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. Um, so Scott is also known as the Homebrew Guru mm -hmm. and um, will hopefully be teaching a class in our upcoming beer tour mm -hmm. um, which we'll post more details about um, pretty soon. Um, but I wanted to talk to Scott a little bit more. We've been friends for about 10 years, so full disclosure. Um, but I actually don't know your homebrew origin story <laughs> as in, in as much detail as maybe I could. Um, so how did you first get started and what inspired you to start brewing beer oh, at boy. home? Um, the short version of the story is that one year my brother got my wife and I a kit for mm -hmm. Christmas or for, I guess it was actually for Eve's birthday mm. and she didn't really feel like doing the brewing so I did it and it just took off from there mm -hmm. and that's going on almost 30 years ago. Yeah. So it's been <laughs> a long strange trip. It really, it really um, stuck with you. Huh? It, it, you know, it was, it was, I've always liked good beer mm -hmm. and I've always had, you know, had to search for beer I liked. It's always easy to find beer of course, but to find beer that I enjoyed was tricky back then, 30 years ago. Sure, I was going to say that's before the big craft, the before the craft, big craft brew boom, exactly. revival. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so I started brewing at that point um, a few times a year, basically, and then it just got easier and easier to find ingredients and equipment, and I started brewing more often. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I got a little wise and, and decided I could write my own book, so I wrote my own book, mm -hmm. and it caught the attention of Greg Noonan, who was about to open the Seven Barrel Brewery here in West Lebanon. And uh, he was looking to open a homebrew shop as part of the brewery and hired me to run the, sh the shop. We're talking 1994 at this point. Right. And uh, that led to Greg and Mike Redman, who was the original home head brewer at Seven Barrel. And I co-wrote a book, Seven mm -hmm. Barrel Brewery Brewer's Handbook. Um, and that led to being able to write feature articles and a monthly column for Brewery Own Magazine for a number of years. And that led to story calling on me to write North American Clone Brews. Wow. And all of those brewing books, of course, meant that you had to brew so that you could test out recipes and things. So I Absolutely. began to brew as often as probably 30 or 40 times a year. Wow. Which is ridiculous in hindsight. <laughs> right. It's a lot of beer. That is a lot of beer. But um, but you still brew pretty frequently. I still frequently. brew every two, three times a month. Mm -hmm. um, I've reduced my brewing to only three gallon batches just because I can't keep up with the mm -hmm. supply. Right. <laughs> the demand is there, but the supply is... Right. Right, yeah. and it and it takes a lot of time too. Yeah. Um, Rick and I don't brew that often, but we've been brewing more frequently lately. Mm -hmm. And it can be a whole day endeavor. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes it doesn't have, have to be, but it can be. If you have Certainly. to haul your equipment out from right. storage and right. you know heat up your water and all that stuff. Yep. Um, so I wanted to back up. So tell me a little bit more about the the original book because I know your home your clone brew book, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about in a second. But yep. um, what was the seven barrel? The seven barrel brewery book? handbook um, was an attempt by. The three of us to come out with the ultimate brewer's manual um, mm. and it, it's all-encompassing I mean it's it's from absolute beginner to advanced all grain techniques um, mm -hmm. we went according to the BJCP style guidelines mm -hmm. and put in recipes at all three levels mm -hmm. extract based partial mash based all grain for right. every single recognized style in the BJCP wow. list that's a so huge it's, I mean, it's undertaking. A thick book. I mean it's, yeah. it's nice and is that still available is it, it is still in no print? longer a print okay. um, you can find it on Amazon or on eBay for over a thousand dollars a copy, and Whoa. <laughs> you know, I wish I was still getting a little crack at that a little right. royalty, but uh, right. Oh well, we'll uh, we'll at least include the title in case right. uh, anyone really right. wants to to hunt that down. Every once in a while, you do find a copy for ten or twelve bucks, but right, it's, right. Uh, it's well, it seems like print, a good a good reference. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice. Maybe some publisher watching this video you know? would like to re-release yeah. it now. Um, so that's cool. So then you were the homebrew uh, manager mm -hmm. at the shop for mm -hmm. how many years? Six, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm my second book, The North American Clone Brews, came out in 2000, and I believe I was still running the shop at Seven Barrel when that came out. Right. And not long after that, my son started high school full time, and that was when I decided that I couldn't do that because I was teaching high school French at the same right. time and going down and to the shop after stuff. school. Yeah. Right. So, man. <laughs> <laughs> Busy. Yes. But dedicated to beer, which yes. is good. Um, 
So yeah, so the your North American Clone Brews book has really been helpful to uh, Rick and myself mm -hmm. um, in starting to do more home brewing and moving into the all grain um, process. Um, we've used a number of your recipes just as written and also a number as jumping off points and say, okay, this is a really good basic stout recipe. We know we like it right. and let's add to it or change it. Or that's that's it. the whole so idea behind home brewing. Really nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but how did that book come about um, initially? The, uh, the column that I was writing in Brew Your Own was basically a clone column. Once a month mm. I would take a reader request, can you help me create a recipe for such and such a beer that I had while I was traveling? Mm -hmm. um, and if I could get a hold of the beer, I went mm -hmm. and bought it and I tasted it and I tried to duplicate, come up with a recipe that, as I would brew it. Um, sometimes I had to call on the brewery or you know, some other other resources to find the recipe if it wasn't something that was available where I was living. Right. Um, but it was just, you know, here are recipes to brew at home, mm -hmm. 100 or so of your favorite North American craft beers. Mm -hmm. It was a follow-up to one that uh, Mark and Tess Shamatowski down in Connecticut had done a few years earlier just called Clone Brews, mm -hmm. which was global in scope. And okay. the story wanted one that was focused exclusively on U.S. and Canadian breweries. North American, so, yeah. yeah. And at that point, that was the 90s, so that was the, kind of the start of it was the revival the first of craft wave, brewing yes. and, and home brewing, I guess, yeah. getting more um, widely available, Definitely. as you said, with suppliers and yep. and local local shops. Yep. Um, yeah, but it's a great book. I would recommend it heartily, and I will link to uh, places you can still buy that one. Um, mm -hmm. So, Including here at the shop. Yep, <laughs> yep. Um, Signed copies available here at the shop. Hey, all right. Um, you can't get those online necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this store. We're in Lebanon, New Hampshire, which yes. is just over the border from Vermont, yeah. where we both live. Um, we we're officially we're known as the Lebanon Brew Shop. Um, once upon a time, we were a health food store. We had, you know, the whole line of vitamins and supplements and all natural beauty products and so on. And mm -hmm. in one corner of the store, um, a previous employee had set up a homebrew section. Mm -hmm. mostly because he wanted access to homebrew supplies for himself. Mm -hmm. So that grew a little bit and a little bit at a time. And then we started carrying a line of, of good craft beer, especially New Hampshire and Vermont craft beers. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became, that, that, that it occurred to us that that was what was really growing the fastest in mm -hmm. the store. So about two and a half years ago now, um, we made the decision to close down the health food side of the store. We actually, where we're sitting right now was a cafe, a sandwich and soup cafe. Okay, yeah. That was the first thing that closed. Um, it just, it was losing money, frankly. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, you know, the health food section, the, the vitamins and supplements and the all natural stuff uh, was not doing well enough to warrant the space it was taking up. Mm -hmm. And the homebrew aspect and the craft beer aspect was growing exponentially. Yeah. So March of 15, March of 16, Mm -hmm. We decided that that was going to be the business model going forward, 100%, and we expanded and took over the entire store. Wow. So that's great. Half of our sales are craft beer and wine, and half of our sales are home brewing equipment and supplies and ingredients. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. And I think having this kind of resource regionally, um, if you can find one in your area, yes. it's such a good resource because not only can you get your supplies yep. and you can order them in small quantities, you know, if you want to just make a tiny yep. amount of something. Yep. Um, but you get knowledge and experience That's the thing. from you know, the yet, staff. The store has to be staffed with people who actually do brew. Right. So, I mean, obviously I brew. A mm -hmm. colleague, Jason, makes wine, so he mm -hmm. teaches the winemaking classes and does a lot of the, mm -hmm. the wine ordering and so on. And right. it's just, it's, it, it's a necessary resource, I think. If you're going to learn to brew, if you're going to ask questions, you need to have somebody who actually knows the answers to the questions. Right, you exactly. The and, has, <laughs> and has the experience yeah. and saying, yeah, well, I tried that method, but right. it didn't really work. You might want to try something else instead or try this. Oh, we don't have that hop. We can't get that hop, but Here's you, can, you can right. substitute example, that yeah. one. Or, yep. Yeah, different ingredients. It's been it's been really helpful. And I, I've mentioned this before in these videos. Um, for my, my fiber arts crew who are also probably watching this, um, you know, it's like having a local yarn shop. Yes, you can get patterns on the internet. Yes, you can order yarn on the internet. Yes, you can order hops and grains on the internet and equipment. But having someone with that knowledge and being able to help guide you is really key. So I encourage you to find the homebrew store that's closest to you and to use them as a good resource and support them because mm -hmm. um, they will support you in, in learning new techniques and uh, new styles that you might be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned classes. So you guys right. teach classes here pretty regularly. We do regularly. classes. Yeah, it's a basically a six-week cycle. And okay. it's a three-part class the way we do it. For the general public, um, mm -hmm. a brew day followed by a day where we rack from primary to secondary, followed by two weeks later 
a bottling experience. Mm-hmm. And participants do much of it hands-on. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I help them design a recipe and set them to work. Yeah. Stirring and grinding and mixing, and mm-hmm. they do the bottling and capping at the end, and they go home with a six-pack of the beer that they've made. That's great. Which is fun. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Yep. And you can be proud of what you did and also get that feeling of, okay, this is feasible. Some ownership. And, now I yeah. know how to do this yeah. and I can actually reproduce the results. Yep. And that's something that we're going to try to recreate on our tour. Um, we're going to be touring a couple of local small breweries. We're going to be doing some tastings, mm-hmm. of course. But we're also going to come here and learn from Scott in this lovely kitchen. <laughs> um, and um, while you won't be able to do the racking because, of course, things have to ferment and that takes time, but we will um, be able to ship you your finished beer at or the end something. of it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and of course, you'll get the knowledge and experience from Scott, who's um, you know had many years not just brewing but teaching and helping other people get started. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, I don't know if we have a tasting. Do we have something we can do? Well, welcome back. Um, before we get started with our tasting, actually, I had one follow-up question for Scott. Um, so in addition to the classes, there's now a new um, homebrew club Correct. Yep. that's associated with the with the shop. Mm-hmm. And um, that's kind of developed out of a homebrew club that was a little closer to us up in Tunbridge. Yep. Uh, but it's kind of melded with the Upper Valley Beer Society in, and, and, and other other groups that were around. Two-thirds of people that yeah. are coming have not been in either group. So it's nice. Yeah. We're getting a lot of fresh water. It's really that's great. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So what kind of um, events or, or, or topics are you guys discussing? Well, we are, we're meeting monthly, the first mm-hmm. Thursday of every month. And we haven't really set up a structure long term, but it's sort mm-hmm. of after each meeting, emails go around and say, what would you like to do next time? What, mm-hmm. So as of last night, we had a meeting and uh, one of our members, Chris, presented um wild and sour and funky beers and mm-hmm. went through the whole how those beers occur, how, how beers get sour, how you can do the, you know, get the beers funky if that's what you want to do. Mm-hmm. And we tasted examples of, you know, a, a, a Flanders Red and a Lambique and a Goza and, mm-hmm. you know, some other things that were in that mm-hmm. range, American Wild Ales and things. Yeah. Nice, nice gathering and cool. I think we all learned something. Yeah. Which is, you know. That's the point of Part the club, of what we're doing, right? right? Is to learn about exactly. new styles. Maybe yeah, the, maybe you'll be inspired to beer, brew them or not, yeah. but at least you can appreciate them, understand exactly. what they're about, yeah. and and learn about them. Sometimes, and, you know, the, Scott will uh, say the club is called Hops H O P S, which yeah. stands for Homebrew Outreach and Preservation Society. And the O is the most important part in there because it is mm-hmm. outreach. And yeah. We would like to get other people interested in brewing, and mm-hmm. the best way to do that is to share our homebrew with them right. and explain to them, show them how it was made, right? So, Compare with commercial beers. Exactly. Yep. And yeah, learn about learn about styles. I was going to say that um, you know Scott will sometimes bring beer to parties that we have at our house, and he'll say this is a whatever, and I'll say, <laughs> wow, I've never heard of that style, you know. So it's it's fun. You can do that on a on a bigger scale when you have more people Definitely. than you're in a shared hobby, <laughs> and also maybe for people who have a spouse or a roommate who's not as interested in their hobby maybe they're interested in the results but they the, mm. the how you got there part is like <laughs> eh, too much information so you can hang out with your people and learn uh with them and learn more about the chemistry and the science behind it and all of that yeah. if you're if you're kind of a beer nerd um so yeah. let's get our beer nerd on sure. and talk about this okay. um so this is a, a a class product uh not exactly um outside in the back alley there behind the store um <laughs> we have a number of hop rhizomes hop plants that grow up every year. Okay. Um, so every the last couple of years we've been harvesting the hops and brewing with them mm. and brewing with them fresh. I mean, mm-hmm. We've had a crew picking them on a Saturday morning and wow. we're brewing with them within a couple hours. So they're yeah. very, very fresh, very aromatic. Nice. So this year we brewed just basically an IPA mm-hmm. um, it and it ended color. up with something nice. like, like nine ounces freshly picked hops. We don't uh-huh. know what varieties they are because they've been planted for longer than any of us have been working here. Right. So we just guess. Mm-hmm. We know there are at least three different varieties and we just kind of called them a- hop A, B, and C and mm-hmm. used them. All right. And well, cheers to ABC cheers to beer. ABC beer. Right, exactly. Mm. It's rather tasty. It's very nice. It's actually improving with age, I think. Uh-huh. There isn't as much aroma as there was when it was first bottled. Um, this would have been brewed in the beginning of September, mm-hmm. um, and um, yeah, it's a little light spice on the nose. Light spice on the nose, exactly. So I'm, I'm, you know, I have a sense of what the hops might be, but I wouldn't swear 
What's your, wouldn't bet what's my your life on. best guess? One of them I'm positive is Cascade, just because okay. that's what everybody in New England yeah. is able to grow through yeah. and want interested in growing hops. I think one of them is Chinook, mm -hmm. just because there is a little bit of a, of a grapefruit mm -hmm. kind of a flavor in there, which typically yeah. is Chinook. Um, plus the cones were, you know, long and narrow, so yeah. that's, that's typically what my Chinook at home looked like. So uh -huh. that's what I'm guessing. Third, I have no clue. Could be Cluster, could be Centennial, could be almost anything. Okay. But... And what was your grains? Uh, it was a real basic, um, you know, like just basically pale ale with a little bit of caramel malt just to give mm -hmm. it that deep gold amber color. Right. Um, For an IPA. That's so just yeah. all we did. Um, I think we might have put a little wheat in it. I really don't have the recipe in front of me. Mm -hmm. I often will add wheat to things like IPAs because it improves body and head retention. Yeah, I was going to say the so head's holding on really, really tight. Nice, so. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's impressive. Although if you'd seen us pouring it, it filled the cup with foam first and settled out to this. So, <laughs> yeah. but it's warm. We're drinking this at room temperature right. rather than cold. But it's very nice. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of warm. it's actually kind of hot in the store right now. So, even this at sixty it's, it's degrees <laughs> feels feels cold and refreshing. Yeah. It's very nice. It's good. I can live with that. Yeah. 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 Good. Cheers. Cool. Um, I will also link to Scott's blog. Um, he has a number of entries for recipes he's developed or experiments he's tried or things so I you know I think that's really interesting if you're looking to branch out or just looking for inspiration or what somebody else has been doing um, I think that's really good but yeah so the moral of the story is get involved with your local homebrew club and your local brew shop they can be a great resource um, and if you're interested in coming on our beer tour um, sign up at the link below and uh, you'll be the first to know about our, our program. It's probably going to be in mid-August of this year, um, but again, we'll have details coming up soon. So thanks again My for pleasure. joining me, Scott. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, keep brewing, guys. Keep experimenting. <laughs> Let us know how it's going and what you're into. Cheers.